Good morning, Tofield Alliance. How's everybody doing this morning? I know this isn't quite the way that we had intended to get together, and uh, we're somewhat disappointed that it has to be over video instead of in person. But on the other hand, we're hopeful that things will uh, move in the right direction in the next week or two, and that we'll be able to meet together and actually uh, share a service together over the next couple of weeks as I bring the message to you. We'll see what happens. We'll just play it by ear. So this morning, I really wanted to share with you a little bit about the love of God, but more than just the love of God, some of the challenges that face us as we consider God as a God of love, and as we try to understand scripture and certain passages in light of that declaration. I don't know about you, but I know for myself, I can often be, or at least sometimes, be overwhelmed by the love of God. I'll read different passages, like 1 John 4, 8, where it talks about God is love, and it's just an amazing concept that God would be defined by love. Uh, I'll read other passages, like the end of Romans 8, where it talks about the love of Christ and how nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and how vast and uh, undescribable it is. Um, or reading about Jesus and his death and resurrection and understanding that God took on human flesh to uh, experience this world with us, to live through everything that we've lived through, and then to die and to pay the price for our sacrifices. And that is something that is just amazing and can really uh, inspire me and motivate me and challenge me and overwhelm me with God's deep love. There are other things uh, just in life in general, when you're going around, uh, walking around town or going to special vacation places, when you see the beauty and the nature that God has created and how vast and amazing this planet is that can hold so many of us and sustain all of us, or just the family and the relationships and the friendships that we have that um, show the goodness of God in giving these things to us. And so there are a lot of things that can really make me uh, amazed by the love of God. But there are other things that can cause me to question the love of God. Uh, I'm not really speaking about events that happen to me in my life. Uh, I know that we live in a broken world, and I know that there are going to be moments when bad things happen, and that that does not negate God's love. He has both promised to be with us through all of that. He has promised us glory that far surpasses any suffering that we face. And so those are difficult circumstances, but they don't really cause me personally to question the love of God. And I know it's something that we've talked about on other occasions. Uh, how do we deal with when bad things happen? So that's not really my focus. My focus is a little bit more on, uh, in particular, the passages of Scripture that can sometimes cause us to question whether God really is a loving God. And these are things that not just uh, I question, but as I interact with a lot of people and as I talk with people, uh, especially non-Christians, but also very often people within the church, where they can kind of go, okay, it says God is loving, but what about this passage? And what about this concept? And what about this? And there seem to be things within Scripture that contradict this idea that God is love. I want to talk about three of those um, ideas or three of those challenges in particular. The first one is when God orders specific or mass punishment. We think in particular of uh, the Israelites moving into the promised land and destroying and running out the Canaanites. That's the one that seems to get a lot of people really uptight and upset. And they say, okay, if God is a God of love, how can he order people to be killed? The second issue is, uh, how is it possible that we only offer salvation through Jesus, or it's only people who are possible for people to have salvation through Jesus? Uh, people will look around and say, there are so many good people in this world, for example. Um, and yes, salvation obviously is a tremendous blessing, but uh, it seems to really, really limit people. And especially as people look at things and say, well, there are so many people in the world who have never heard about Jesus. What does it mean when we say that they are all going to be punished, that they're all going to hell, as we would usually say, because they don't know about Jesus? And this really causes people to question the love of God. The third thing is quite simply that uh, idea of hell. And what do we mean when we talk about uh, eternal conscious torment and how on earth is that possible for a loving God? So those are sort of the issues that I want to look at. And I want to suggest that perhaps we need to... Um, evaluate our perspective, that perhaps we need to expand uh, our concepts, and perhaps we need to reinterpret a few things. So let's dive into that. 
The first concept that we find is the idea that God orders a specific or mass punishment or even individual punishment. And so we think of stories like uh, Israel being led out of Egypt and of course God punishing Egypt and leading them out. We think of them entering the promised land and how they destroyed Jericho and the walls fell down and we think of uh, then they destroyed Ai and, and a few other places and, and uh especially verses where it talks about the man, women, and children, and that you must destroy them all. And people go, that's horrific. How could God do that? We think of some of the passages where God threatens judgment on Israel, and then we know eventually he does judge Israel and uh, sends both Israel and Judah into exile at different times. Or individual stories, Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the church about the money that they had received in, in Acts 5 and are struck down. Or Achan in Joshua chapter 7, when he uh, hides some of the things that were supposed to be destroyed uh, as they were after they had destroyed uh, Jericho and God in eventually destroys him and his family for this disobedience. And so we find various stories of either uh, corporate punishment or individual punishment where God brings about death and destroys people or orders people to be killed. And that just does not resonate with a lot of people uh, when it comes to understanding God as a God of love. And I, I pretty much understand that or can see where people would struggle with that. I think in this case, what we really need to do is we need to get for ourselves and offer to others a much larger perspective than just those single events. Because if you look at the stories uh, within their larger context, we actually find something very significantly different. We find God promising the land of Abraham, or the, the promised land to Abraham, but saying very specifically in Genesis that the uh, sins of the people had not yet reached their full measure. And in fact, it was hundreds of years before God finally brought the Israelites into that land and brought judgment upon the residents of Canaan. We also know that a lot of the stuff that God speaks about, uh, children being sacrificed, other things like that, um, are not exactly things that even nowadays we would be particularly comfortable with. Um, I think as well, if you look at uh, the land of Israel, we find God punishing them. But again, we don't necessarily find that these were just innocent people. And I think that's sort of our the big struggle a lot of people have is, what about all the innocent Canaanites? What about all of the innocent people in Israel and whatnot? But if you look at the descriptions and if you look at how God is talking about um, the Israelites when he's threatening judgment on them, he's talking about the fact that they are full of corruption, that there's injustice, that their judges are taking bribes, that there is greed, that there is uh, oppression, that they're, um, they're not taking care of the children and the widows, uh, that there is a lack of mercy and so many different things. In fact, pretty much as you read the list of things that God's upset about, they are all exactly the same things that we would get upset about and that we think are awful. And so that gives us a little bit of a different perspective that God is not just rushing in and destroying some nice innocent people. In every case where we see God's judgment poured out, it is on people who have been disobeying, who have been stealing, who have been corrupt, who have been evil. And so we need to have that proper perspective. We also need to understand that God shows continuous, long-lasting mercy. Like I said, 400 plus years before he poured out judgment on the Canaanites. Or how many hundreds of years was God sending prophets to the Israelites and threatening and cajoling and trying to get them to turn back to him before he finally sent judgment upon them and actually sent them into exile. And so we see that God... Uh, gives lots of warning, that God offers mercy, that God calls him to repentance. And, and then even when he does pour out his judgment, it's for very specific purposes and for a very specific short time. We see Ananias and Sapphira who were, were struck down. But how many others were doing things that were wrong and God did not strike them down? There was one couple for one particular pers uh, per, um, purpose that God struck down to help his church understand their need to be holy. Same with Achan as they were just starting and just moving into the land and taking over the land. God felt it important to make a point and so he had one very limited case where he poured out his wrath. 
And so in all of these, we see that, yes, there are moments of God's anger and God's wrath, but they are very limited and, and very, I don't want to say minor because they're important, but they're certainly not God being angry at everybody, destroying everybody all the time for the least little thing that they do wrong. And so we need to have a proper perspective and a proper understanding of God's judgment. What's more is we understand that um, God often would grant reprieves. How many times did somebody turn to him, especially in the land of Judah, and God withheld from the destruction that he had promised? Or we think of the case of Jonah as a, a great example, where God sent him to Nineveh to preach uh, destruction, and the people of Nineveh repented, and God said, okay, that's fine. And we find all the way through Scripture that God does not like bringing about judgment. He wants to bring forgiveness. He wants to bring reconciliation and to have have a relationship with them. And so we need to understand and put all of this in perspective. And when we do, both for ourselves and for others, I think we get this idea that God is a loving God, that God is incredibly patient, that God is pursuing a relationship, that God is trying to win people back. And yes, eventually he does pour out judgment. And yes, some of those things are hard to read about. But when we have a proper perspective, we see that they are preceded by uh, countless messages of, of mercy and of offering redemption and restoration before God brings about judgment. So I think there, when we get a proper perspective, we can still look at this and say God is a God of love. Well, what about the second issue? This is a, a pretty big one where we start talking about salvation and how is it possible that God only saves people through Jesus? Uh, this is a tricky one, especially in our culture and in our world, because there, we are aware of so many different religions and so many different ideas out there. And uh, it can be very hard as a Christian to stand here and say, Jesus is the only way to go to heaven. And we, we want to, and we need to, and we do affirm that. That is what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so we very much want to believe that and affirm that and hold on to that. The challenge is there are probably at least three and a half billion people, if not more, who have never heard about Jesus. There are countless others who have sort of heard about him, but completely misunderstand him for different reasons or don't know who he is or has never been taught properly. And we struggle to say, and, and people struggle to hear us say that Jesus is the only way to heaven when they are well aware of the vast quantities of people who do not have access to that. So how do we approach that? I think in this issue, what we really need to do is we need to expand to a degree and in a way our understanding of salvation and what it means to have salvation through Jesus Christ. And to do that, I really want to look at Romans chapter 1. And this is where I'm going to get into some specific passages. Because we would say and we would teach that our the means of, of uh, salvation is faith. We are called to have faith and we are saved through faith. And we would very quickly add that means faith in Jesus Christ. And yes, that is true. Jesus Christ is who God gave to bring life or fullness to our faith, as it were. He is the fulfillment of our faith. He is the one who has made this relationship with God possible and brings it to a depth of understanding that is not possible in any other way. But I think as we look at Romans chapter 1, we actually find something quite interesting. In Romans chapter 1, we read, for in the gospel, this is verse 17, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so we have this idea that we are called to faith and we are saved through faith. And in fact, if we jump forward a little bit further, we sort of find, not sort of find, we do find God explaining, or pardon me, Paul explaining how this works. If we jump to chapter 4, we find him talking about how Abraham was justified by faith. What I find really, really intriguing by this is that when we look at the life of Abraham, what do we discover? We discover that God spoke to him and said, I want you to leave this land and go to a place that I will show you. 
and I will bless you. And Abraham responded to that minute revelation of God and what God wanted with obedience. And God looked at that obedience, as we see in chapter 4, and he considered it to faith. Chapter 4, verse 3, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so we find that the example par excellence, if you want to use that phrase, of faith that Paul points to is Abraham. And Abraham knew nothing about Jesus. He knew nothing about the Ten Commandments. He knew nothing about the Law of Moses. All he knew was the little bit that God had revealed to him when God spoke to him. And yet he believed that little bit, as imperfect as we would call that faith to be, he had faith in what God revealed, and he was saved through that faith. Now we would also say, as we look at scripture, that Moses and Abraham and all of these were saved through faith in Christ, even though they knew absolutely nothing about Christ. And so we find a very interesting reality. Everybody in the two, four, six thousand, however many thousands of years before Jesus, if anybody was saved, and we would say every, you know, the vast majority of saints that we meet in the Old Testament were saved even though they knew nothing about Jesus. That should give us pause for thought. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 how they were looking forward and anticipating uh, a different country, being citizens of another country, and, and what was to come. And that sort of brought them salvation. And so I think that there is lots of room for us to consider what this looks like in our world. You see, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, we look at them and we have this heavy, heavy tendency to focus on them and say, look at all of these people. And Paul seems to be showing that people are not saved eventually by the law, but that people are sinful before God. And he is indeed pointing that out. And we see him talking about general revelation, that God's invisible qualities have been known, and so people are without excuse. And we look at Romans chapter 2, where he talks about their conscience. And we look at all of this, and we look at it only through the lens of these people are condemned because God has revealed himself, and they have not responded, and therefore all people are guilty. But what I find really interesting is when you think about it, Paul is speaking to a specific audience who would know, and and indeed there were many in the, the Greek reality who worshipped idols and turned away from God and worshipped other idols. But we know from much of human history that many people have looked around and have been conscious of a creator God and have not turned to worshipping idols, but have instead sought God and tried to do what is right. I think what else is interesting is chapter 2 gives us a picture of man's conscience and some of the stuff that it says in there certainly leaves wide open the door that people are saved through faith because they have been given a conscience and they are reacting to what God has revealed on their conscience. So read verses 6 to 8, where it says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. And so here we see something that we see very much throughout all of Scripture, that God judges people based on what they do. And why is that? Well, because what we do sort of flows from our heart, as Jesus teaches, and shows what we believe. And in this case, Paul is talking about these people, and he's talking about them being granted eternal life because they are persisting in seeking good and glory and honor and immortality. We read a little bit further in verses 14 and following. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets, through Jesus Christ, 
as my gospel declares. And so we have, even in Paul's master treatise to the Romans, this concept, this idea that perhaps God's revelation is more than, or not more than Jesus Christ, but God's revelation is broader than what we try to limit it to. And so that people are saved by faith and perhaps that salvation extends even to people who have imperfect faith and uninformed faith. It's, it's really interesting to me to consider this possibility and to open up the door to salvation a little bit more and to say that God sees people's hearts, God sees how people live based on what he has revealed to them, and that perhaps he could save them. And that saving is still made effectual, as it were, by Jesus Christ. He is still the one who brings it to life just as he did for Abraham. He is the one who fulfills that salvation. And how much better for people if we can teach them about Jesus and point them to Jesus so that they can experience that fullness. And how many other people aren't on this path and when they hear the teaching of Jesus will suddenly recognize their own sin and recognize their need for Christ and their need for salvation and so we still point to Jesus, we still hold Jesus in the center, but I think this is one where we perhaps need to expand our concept of salvation a little bit and say we are saved by faith. Ideally, that faith is in Jesus Christ and we need to proclaim it. And whatever faith is there is fulfilled by Jesus Christ so that all people are saved through him. But just as it was before Christ came, Perhaps God is capable of saving people because they have faith in whatever he has revealed, however imperfect that might be. And so in this particular issue, as we consider the love of God and God's love, and if we know that God looks at, the pe at people's hearts, for myself, I just have to look at it and go, you know what? God is the one who grants salvation, and he grants it through faith. And so... I will leave it in God and I will live in hope that there are many people who have never even heard about Jesus who will still find themselves before God because they have responded in faith to what they have known. And so I think in this one, we as Christians need to expand our understanding of faith a little bit and our understanding of how people are saved through faith. Um, but of course, that doesn't stop us from preaching Jesus Christ as God's way to God and proclaiming that everywhere that we can. The third one is hell, and this is a huge topic. And I think on this one, uh, I don't have the time to go into it the way that I would like. I'm hoping to uh, do a presentation on my YouTube channel talking about this. Uh, so if you just go onto YouTube, look up Chris Ulrichson, you can probably find that. And there, hopefully, I can have a, a much expanded discussion on this. As I've looked into it, this is something that, honestly, uh, when I was living in Mexico, just about crushed me. Uh, because you are surrounded by 22, 23 million people. And as a Christian church, and as Christian Missionary Alliance, um, we teach, as do many evangelical churches, that we believe in hell. That is, those who are not saved, who do not accept Christ, go away to eternal conscious torment. And when you're surrounded by that multitude of people and you feel like everywhere you look, you see people who are going to suffer forever in hell, it is a tremendous burden, a, an incredible burden where you go, God, how on earth could you expect me to be responsible and even us as a church to be responsible to share the gospel with this many people? And how on earth could you send some of these people, some who seem like perfectly nice people, but that's a whole side issue, how could you be condemning so many people to hell so that everywhere I look, nine out of ten people I look at are going to suffer forever in hell? If this doesn't challenge your concept of a loving God, I'm really not quite sure what. There are some serious repercussions and questions that come to light when you start really thinking about this. Questions like God says in various places that he does not want to and he does not like punishing people. And yet we are saying that he is going to punish people for all of eternity. 
uh, you get um, just ideas, or, or if we understand that God sustains all things and all things have their being through him, essentially that means that we end up saying that God is sustaining people, keeping them alive in hell for the purpose of punishing them for all of eternity. And these are things that cause you, or, or at least have caused me to deeply question uh, what exactly we're teaching about hell. I would love to say I have 100% certainty about this. I do not. This is something that I'm struggling with and working on. But the more research that I do, the more I think that we need to reinterpret our understanding of hell. Like I said, I'll try to do a video that goes into more detail about this. But simply put, there are really only a few passages that speak about eternal punishment and eternal suffering. We've got the lake of fire in Revelation. We've got uh, Jesus telling the parable in Matthew 25 of the sheep and the goats. Uh, another passage in Daniel that sort of references that. Jesus almost seems to be quoting that when he's talking about um, the sheep and the goats. We've got a variety of other passages that we tie into this, where Jesus talks about Gehenna, and he talks about the worm that will not die, and weeping of gnashing of teeth, and the outer darkness. The more I study and the more I look at those, the more I think that those are referring back to a lot of Old Testament discussions and symbols that we associate with eternal punishment that I don't necessarily think that we are appropriately uh, interpreting. I think they refer far more to death and to destruction than to eternal torment. I think um, there are a lot of other passages that speak about God destroying the body and soul in hell and various passages like that. And I think that, um, and I'm not alone with this, I've talked to a number of, of evangelical Christians who are really looking at this and saying, are we understanding these passages correctly? Are we understanding them as Jesus would have understood them? When Jesus was speaking about Gehenna, it seems likely that he was speaking about a place of destruction, uh, not necessarily a place of eternal torment. It seems likely that he may have been referring far more to the destruction of Israel based on the prophetic teachings of the Old Testament, rather than speaking about eternal punishment of the individual believer. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that we find in these sayings seem to be fulfilled in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. I do not say that I have this uh, fully figured out by any stretch, but the more I study it, the more I study the scriptural references um, that Jesus would have been using and hearkening back to, the more that I uh, study the history of Christianity and our understanding and some of the imagery the more I suspect that uh, what we consider hell is actually God's wrath and judgment being poured out on people, but perhaps much more in a God will destroy them and grant eternal life to all who are his children and destroy those who are not. Now that might still strike us as, as a horrible thing, but it doesn't quite compare to eternal judgment and suffering. I offer that to you as some thoughts on that. Uh, I don't want to proclaim that to say this is 100% where we are. And I know a lot of people who have grown up in the Western Catholic leading to Protestant, leading to evangelical tradition, who would feel like that is a, an absolute um, blasphemy almost, and a denial of scripture, but it isn't. Um, the more I look at it and the more I... Uh, study a lot of other theologians, many of whom are very, very orthodox, very Christian, very uh, evangelical, I think there's a lot of room to perhaps say, maybe we're misunderstanding this. Maybe God isn't a God that others would describe as a moral monster who is sending people and torturing them forever in hell. Perhaps God's judgment is simply their destruction. So, I offer that to you. I offer that as some thoughts on how we can approach hell in a way that perhaps paints God in a different picture than what our society sees him as, and indeed many in the church see him as, when we speak of a God who sends people to eternal torment in hell. 
you can take that or leave that. By all means, if you've got questions about it, uh, watch the video that in the next, hopefully within the next week, I can have uh, uploaded on my YouTube channel, or drop me a message, drop me an email. Uh, we'll try to get together in some way, whether it's over video or maybe things will open up and we can get together soon uh, for coffee. Uh, but the big thing on that one is I'm not trying to deny Scripture. I'm really trying to be faithful to Scripture and to understand it properly and to interpret it in light of other Scripture. So, um, yeah, so I'll leave that there uh, for your thought and for your reflection. At the end of the day, is it possible for us to look at God in spite of some of these challenges and consider him a God of love? I believe it is. I really deeply think that God's punishment does not deny his love. Any of us who are parents know that. We punish our children. It does not mean we do not love them. We will make some massive changes in discipline in a structure or in something to bring it back on the right track because we love it. And do the same with the person. Punish them because we love them. And so I think we can easily reconcile some of God's punishments, especially when we take a proper perspective, with the concept that God is love. I think that um, opening up this door to say that people can be saved through faith in Christ, even if they don't fully know Christ, for me that brings all sorts of life and breathes all sorts of life and hope that I can leave that in God's hands. He loves those people more than I do. He knows their hearts. I can trust him with that. And in the meantime, I'm going to teach about Jesus as much as I can so that people understand and know who he is. And as far as the eternal destruction of, God, of people versus their eternal torment, it at least gives me hope. It gives me hope that God is not a monster, as many would call him or view him when they look at hell. That perhaps God speaks a final, ultimate judgment on people rather than eternal, never-ending torment on people. It gives me hope that maybe I can understand these things a little bit differently and better line that up with our proclamation that God is love. So I hope that gives you something to think about. Um, I hope it gives you uh, something to hope for when it comes to God is love. And I really hope that as you are sharing the gospel with other people, this gives you perhaps something to share with them that will challenge some of their ideas that make them think that God is not a God of love so that we can together say, no, we firmly believe God is a God of love. Go in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.